So I didn't mention this before because I think I maybe just had forgotten. I didn't really know what the flip was going on. But I'm sure most of you guys are aware that um, Givenchy, no, like Alix founder, sorry, um, Alix founder Matthew Williams, who was recently appointed as a Givenchy men's um, creative director, has unfortunately left, um, which is an odd bit of news, right? Odd, strange bit of news that he stepped down from Givenchy because I thought he was doing a pretty decent job there. But obviously, um, he left under a cloud of some level of certain um, uncertainty i'm not too sure if he left because the cell yeah i'm not i would say i'm not too sure i think it's fairly safe to say the reason why he probably left Givenchy is because the sales weren't good right um they don't really let go most of these fashion houses don't let go of a designer if they're you know hitting their targets sales wise and whatnot it just doesn't make any sense if you're making their money why would they let you go so most likely it's a sales thing but from the time that he started at Givenchy i think a lot of the fashion people out there weren't necessarily fans of him i think maybe um the way that he designs maybe his personality maybe the the fact that they weren't big fans of alix in the first place i don't really think he was ever given a fair shot a fair crack he was almost kind of um people were kind of rooting for him to kind of fail before he even started which is i think kind of unfair when you compare him to the other people who are maybe a little bit more loved within the fashion space, like, you know, Simon Port from Jack Moose, who I feel like hasn't had a good collection um, under Jack Moose for maybe, you know, three or four seasons. It's been pretty shocking, the stuff that he's been putting out. But people don't say nothing because, you know, he's the kind of bell of the dance or whatever it may be. So Matthew Williams gets a lot of unnecessary stick um, for his stuff at Givenchy, which I thought was really strong. Um, I thought he did a lot of good work in terms of bringing Givenchy men's, especially back into the culture zeitgeist you had people especially influencers and a lot of cultural icons and whatever it may be you know flying around the world to go and attend flipping Givenchy shows um the campaigns were really good the runways um the runway collections or the shows themselves sorry were really amazingly um, well put together also um and I felt again he did a good job if it was for a creative director that has no formal design or formal fashion experience for him to come into a house like Givenchy and be able to kind of bring it back into um you know the cultural zeitgeist bring it back into the cultural conversation or the fashion conversation did he did really really well so i think he should have maybe got a little bit more time to flesh out his vision but of course in the world of fashion much like in professional football you don't get time just for the sake of getting time you have to earn it right and every season you start again from scratch same with football every season you start from scratch what you did last season doesn't necessarily count you kind of have to just keep you know it's constantly keep improving constantly keep adding to what you did previously and constantly just keep breaking records and hope along the way that maybe just maybe just maybe that may be able to save um your flipping job so there's an exclusive article here courtesy of gq where matthew williams himself here pictured here in his portrait you know if there's one thing about matthew similar to samuel ross i don't think there's a camera matthew williams has not fucking pulled the zoolander kind of pose on right he fucking loves the camera he's not shy of taking his picture and letting you fucking see his grill so matthew williams in the profile here courtesy of Givon of sorry of gq um kind of speaking about his next chapter here and kind of maybe giving us an insight as to maybe why he stepped down from Givon chi why now he's focusing more on Alix? Even though the Alix thing is interesting, because before the Givenchy announcement came about, there was an announcement that he sold the majority stake in his brand, and Alix was the brand that he launched, um, kind of in collaboration with his ex-wife, kind of, not really, but you know, they, that's kind of how it started. And I think if, it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was kind of named after his daughter as well. So it's got a lot of, you know, there's a lot of personal um relationship um, attachment um with this kind of brand and it kind of launched his career es essentially kind of put him in to the conversation to be considered for the Givenchy job so I find it strange that he would sell the majority stake for his literal baby but I guess maybe in terms of growing the brand and maybe expanding and maybe you know to the point where they have actual retail stores maybe they start hitting different markets maybe the manufacturing and production just ramps up in general maybe you do need to sell um you know the majority stake of the company to some foreign investor for it to kind of really get to the next level so that might be the reason why but let's read the article itself so you can kind of get an idea on what's going on for his next chapter so cursor of gq Two weeks ago, Givenchy announced that Matthew Williams was stepping down as creative director after a three-ish years. The departure had been rumoured for some time, but I, for one, was surprised or at least disappointed by the news, myself included. Creatively, he had just hit a stride at the Audrey Hepburn-linked house, which he overhauled and reintroduced to the generation that bumps to Dilate rather than Moon River. As his predecessor, Chris... Um, 
Claire White Geller um, discovered three years is not a lot of time to turn around a battleship by Givenchy but 2023 is a breakthrough Williams needed his men's collection had a real sense of clarity thanks to the compelling blend of couture craftsmanship and soundcloud styling you know what's been really surprising though I was surprised he didn't get more time when you consider how bad that Claire White Keller um, era of Givenchy was received by a lot of fashion people because looking back at it it actually wasn't that terrible but a lot of the fashion Twitter people or you know commentators out there that didn't like Ajiva and Matthew Williams or also people that would you know that spoke quite negatively about the Claire White Geller era so it's strange really it's really strange because the only really relevant era of Givenchy that people still kind of look back you know with kind of you know rose tinted eyes is obviously the fucking um, what you call it um is obviously the 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 Ricardo Tishi era right the Ricardo Tishi era was brilliant but again you know that was a bygone era that's never coming back Ricardo Tishi himself has kind of fallen off a cliff design wise so I find it interesting that Matthew Williams wasn't given a lot more grace in that respect but anyway continues um but it seems Williams has already been planning on building a vision elsewhere. The news of his departure broke just news um, weeks after Williams confirmed that he had secured investment for a deal of his own brand, 1017 Alix 9SM, with Hong Kong-based luxury tycoon Adrian Cheng. So I guess we can, it's fair to assume the first retail store, the first brick and mortar Alix store would definitely be in Hong Kong, right? Or, right, we can definitely assume it'll be somewhere in Hong Kong or somewhere in Asia, most likely most likely right um it continues though i was rooting for williams at Givenchy. okay i've just seen the score here um, man city won 3-2 against newcastle and the full-time tweet here says the kevin de bruyne show is back in town that's why you know arsenal are never winning the league in it really and truly man city had this guy this guy in a hyperbolic chamber he was out the majority of the season Kevin De Bruyne comes back and all of a sudden he turns around this match which they were losing at half time, gets them winning and now most likely they'll probably win the league again. You know what I mean? That's the that's the fucking the cruel reality of Man City. They just got too many good players. You know what I mean? Too many good players. Haaland is out. Kevin De Bruyne's on the bench. He comes on, scores the equaliser, and then I guess sets up the winner as well. It's just like, pfft, it's not fair. Anyway, continuing. Though I was rooting for Williams of Givenchy, it's hard to deny that Alex might have been more energy behind it. A few months ago, I happened to run into Williams at the Dimes Deli in New York in Chinatown. Matthew Williams hangs out in, hangs out in Dimes Square. That's fucking hilarious. He was wearing Alex and in town to celebrate the brand's ultra buddy collaboration with Audemars Pigot. Um, outside the cafe, two twenty somethings in town from Utah stopped to ask for a selfie. I didn't hear them mention Givenchy, but they were dressed in techno workwear that looked directly downstream from what Williams has been doing at his Milan-based brand since 2015. His most recent Alex collection was also excellent, um, technically accomplished. Williams is a true nerd of fabrics and hardware and tapped into the real brands of you style to be fair when Matthew Williams did get announced as Givenchy founder I think I said it myself on the stream I didn't know why he took the job or, sorry as creative director I didn't know why he took the job I said I thought it would be much more beneficial for him to just focus on Alix because I generally as much as I'm a big fan of Matthew Williams I think it's really difficult for anybody especially somebody that isn't formally trained to balance two creative director jobs it's kind of hard to do almost impossible that's why you know the people that do do them or that did do them in the past you think of people like you know um i can't think of it comes to mind flip i can't remember his flipping name but the ones that have done them in the past have been heralded as some of the greatest designers in the world because to be able to kind of you know have two very distinctly different visions for two different differently distinctive brands or houses is very difficult to do especially season in season out with the demands you know of designers have on them with the fucking resort collections in between with the collaborations or whatever it may be it's just something that is inherently inherently difficult so i was never really that big on him taking a Givenchy job but obviously um as a designer as a creative it's impossible to turn down that role and obviously for him it probably puts you in a whole different conversation maybe you don't get the investment from Alix you know without the exposure um that the Givenchy role gave you and obviously you learn a lot as well right working you know with an artillier working with a fucking working working with couture but not showing couture might actually be um beneficial also and just the experience that you learn from working within that side of fashion with a capital f is definitely things that you can't really buy 
So I understand why he did it. But I think in general, he probably should have focused on his own brand because I think Alix has got far more cachet on the quote unquote streets. The kids care way more about Alix than they do anything about Givenchy really for the biggest, you know, and until somebody actually comes in and actually revives that brand to a level that it probably deserves. I think most kids out there, especially kids that follow Matthew Williams uh, as a person, I probably care way more about, um, you know, Alix as opposed to Givenchy most likely. But again, I could be wrong. It continues. I didn't hear them mention Givenchy, blah, blah, blah. Um, What's that? Da, da, da. Though the terms of his deal with Cheng were not disclosed, the partnership could be a game changer for Alex. Cheng, a young billionaire, property developer, and entrepreneur with a taste for art and fashion, might not be a widespread a widespread name recognition, but he's a heavy hitter. I just saw how heavy firsthand earlier a few weeks ago in Hong Kong, where Louis Vuitton partnered with Cheng to pull off his epic pre four men show. Wow! So that guy was the one that did the show with them. He partnered with them to do that show that was on a boat or something. The runway um abuted his K twelve, his K eleven more, a massive modern um edifice of culture and commerce, and Chen co-hosted off the party at an adjacent hotel he owns. So he did the runway show at a mall he owns, and the party was at a hotel he also owns. God damn, this Adrian Chen guy is fucking bar ling. The K eleven art mall is a seven story shopping mall. Seven stories. In in Tizim Ta in Tizim Sa Sui, Hong Kong, located in the masterpiece developed by New World Development and a completed in December two thousand and nine. It is near the the, the, the bar. The hell, bro! Jesus, seven stories. Wow, <laughs> this looks incredible, bro. It's just like a celebration of glass, right? Glass and still everywhere. Loads of amazing lights. It's almost got these weird ball designs on the inside as well. I'm not sure if these are lifts or if it's just like a separate cafe area, but I love these kind of protruding, internally protruding ball things on the inside of the actual shopping mall itself. Loads of natural light is coming in. It looks like, it looks like a kaleidoscope prism and shit with all the light that kind of leaks through, which is kind of cool. And of course, all the quality, shop, all the quality um, shops everywhere on the inside as well. But yeah, a seven-story mall is fucking wild, isn't it? Seven stories is like, god damn. How much shopping is enough shopping? But yeah, cool. So big up Adrian Cheng. So it continues. Um, on Wednesday afternoon, Williams described his move as a restart in a way. A new era for one. He's moving Alex to Paris. Wow, okay. So it's completely changing. Because I always thought that Alex was based in Milan because of New Guards Group. I just assumed that Virgil Abloh RIP was involved in terms of helping him get, you know, spon what get a um, manufacturing production help or whatever it may be behind the scenes. I always thought that was a reason, but I get it's not. But that's moving to Paris. Okay, Williams joined the Zoom call from a table set uh, for lunch, a leafy Parisian rooftop view stretching behind him. It was his lunch break and the designer turned off his camera about halfway through so he could eat his meal. Williams has always expressed a curious mix of intensity and humility. He wears dark fashion and quotes Playboy Carti, but is also a ma mild-mannered dad. Um, the former Lady Gaga collaborator, obsessive design mind, launched him to the top of the fashion establishment. Blah, blah, blah. In Paris, his lunch is served to him on a fancy tableware. Okay, cool. Let's leave your fucking interview. You're in this moment of transition right now. How are you feeling? How excited are you? I feel great. I'm super excited to have Alix move to Paris. It's been it's been a, my move. It's been my home for the past three years. So he's been traveling between Milan and Paris. Fucking hell, what a life, mate. Some people have it all good, isn't it? Jesus Christ. It's an amazing city. There's so much inspiration here. Also, great people to work with. Building a next phase of Alix after almost 10 years is really exciting. I've always been very motivated and given lots of energy to Alix, but it's nice to have the restart in a way sometimes when you're doing something for so long in the same system there's not an opportunity to kind of reset and it feels great to be given that and to kind of take it and learning from the past decade and then begin he feels very enthusiastic and positive about it but maybe i'm a little bit cynical but i feel a little bit worried if you're in, if this guy is investing how much he's investing into the fucking brand i've got a feeling that there's going to come a moment where he's going to want to kick this guy out and just do things his own way because when you put the money up, you're kind of the boss in it. When you put the majority of the money up, it's basically your brand. And I would hate you for it to end that way. But Matthew Williams seems to be very, 
very enthusiastic about it very happy about it um but yeah it, i wouldn't be surprised if maybe a few years down the line you see him leaving alix and going to set up another brand because this adrian chen guy just takes over and starts to just you know do his own thing there i don't know it kind of feels like it but hey who knows can you tell me a little bit about the decision to step down from Givenchy? I mean, Alex is going to take a lot of my time and focus to push into the next chapter. So I want to be committed to Alex and give everything I need. It's going to take a lot of energy and love and care and support, which I've always given. You see, I don't like that answer because it's not the truth. Because the truth is most likely it's a mutual decision, but most likely Givenchy are the ones that didn't want to maybe extend his contract because he obviously didn't sell enough product, which is okay. I don't think it's a bad thing. Again, I'm a big fan of the guy as a designer, but I would love if there was a little bit more honesty in fashion when it comes to these sort of things. Like if somebody got fired for gross misconduct, say it. Like I know you, technically you can't, but you know, at least leak it or something like not putting a cloud over somebody's head or making it seem like they did get fired because of gross misconduct or making it seem like they did get fired because they don't have the ability to design stuff that people want to buy. It's just annoying. You know what I mean? It's just not necessary. Um, I, I would much rather a little bit more honesty, like what actually happened? Did you get fired because of your poor performance? Was it, you know, were the sales targets unrealistic? Was there like internal beef? Did you maybe butt heads with some people, you know, in, in fucking, in head office that you probably didn't see eye to eye with, which I could really understand to be a thing, especially culturally and vibe wise. You could probably understand why maybe some people, you know, some of the older folks maybe in Givenchy maybe didn't vibe with him too much, especially his vision of what Givenchy could be, especially when it comes to, you know, focusing a lot on the black people and the black culture and stuff. Maybe a lot of those guys didn't like that. Who knows? But whatever the case, I would love there to be a bit more transparency that sort of stuff but hey we'll never know it continues but did you find it hard in the last few years so but did you find it harder in the last three years to really give Alex the focus and attention you wanted he says no 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 I had a lot of my attention I was traveling to Milan a lot I love the work that we put in over the past few years but the kind of support that's being given also has to be met with the new energy new challenges and etc etc so he says he wasn't so maybe that's why Givenchy suffered. Maybe he was spreading himself too thin. Maybe he was putting all his energy into Givenchy and all his energy when he was available into Alix. And maybe something had to give. So maybe he's saying the truth. Who knows? Tell me more about this restart and why you're moving Alix, to Paris, Alix Studio to Paris. Paris has become my home for the past three years and a half. And I love living here. My CEO lives in London. My kids live in London. It's just a nice proximity to everyone. Oh yeah, I think his kids live in London with them. The wife's new partner, which is uh, what's his name, Blondie McCoy, in it, which is a bit awkward because I think they used to be friends, so that must be a bit strange. But I guess it's nice to be close to the family. But I think in general, when it comes to menswear, anyway, um, outside of the streetwear bubble, um, Paris is a place to be. All the studios are there, all the showrooms are there. The biggest menswear show of the season is in Paris, also. So it does make sense if you're not like a North American based brand, you probably should be based in Paris, really and truly. It does make a lot more sense. Or maybe London's second, but London's a bit shit to be fair. I know I live here, but London's kind of terrible. So if I had to pick somewhere to live, especially if I was, you know, um, if my if I had a passion for fashion, it definitely would be Paris. It continues. What else is going to change? What's new about how you're approaching the thinking about? Alex. being able to go being able to do retail now is really exciting he says you've come to showrooms or pop-ups that we've done over the years so you had the moments where you could have actually fill alix in the space and its full collection but that was really felt um but but that was rarely felt at a wholesale level. When you when you would go into an account that we sold with, it would be kind of um, a piecemeal together. So I'm really excited for everyone to experience Alex in full space um, and to be able to focus more on some of the categories that I always wanted to expand on, accessories, jewelry, shoes, being able to really move, um, show an offering of those categories is really exciting me, um, exciting to me, sorry, and even launch to other zones. We've done stuff in music this year i want it to continue to be a brand that plays a lot of different spaces cultural um and continue to use as a platform for the community that i love and support and co-create space for okay this definitely explains why he did the investment then because this you know he's got different product categories he wants to move into in terms of accessories and jewelry and shit there's obviously the option to have your own brick and mortar store, which is definitely going to happen. That's probably the first thing on the list, most likely going to be in Hong Kong or somewhere else in Asia. And then of course, there's the ability to do the other things as well, like the mixtape they put out recently and other bits and pieces that can only be done if you've got some real big investment in you. Again, it's kind of proof again, why fashion is such a hard industry to break into because Alix for me, isn't some buster 
you know, t-shirt brand. It's a legit fashion brand, a legit, maybe, I don't know, cut and sew, elevated streetwear, whatever you want to kind of term it, but it's an actual legit brand that sells stuff. And he still, he couldn't just fund it himself through the sales or the profits of the company. There had to be external investment coming in. So it kind of shows just how expensive it is um, to run a fashion brand on a somewhat, you know, on that kind of level, especially if you have really big ambitions. It's kind of hard to do it without any big investment. Um, that kind of explains a lot of why people do take investment um, when it comes to their brands and why the ones that don't, you have to kind of give them a lot of respect because it's really hard to not to do so. Um, right. You could say in recent years, Elix has matured into the more of a lifestyle brand. I suppose retail is the final piece of the puzzle. How did the partnership with Adrian come together? We originally met through Days Media founder Jefferson Hack. Oh, big up to Jefferson Hack. That's a fucking OG. Big up Jefferson Hack. Um, he might be part of the reason, or he, he's probably my muse when it comes to the return of Indie Sleaze. I remember I was obsessed with Jefferson Hack back in the day, but I'd read all these fucking interviews and whatever it may be. And then I still remember that legendary interview that he did with um, Showstar studio where the woman was grilling him super hard on there it was, it was kind of a combative interview but big up Jeff jefferson hack absolute legend um we originally met through jefferson hack in 2017 2018 and um, adrian was visiting milan and we met for dinner and then we continued to become friends over the years adrian's really involved in the arts and a big supporter of the artists and cultural projects and i already um, really admired that about him i think he has incredible taste so we hang out a lot and just talk about things that we're really inspired by and he was visiting paris and just came over to my house to catch up i mentioned that i was speaking to different partners for alix and he was like oh that could be cool to do together send me over the info and then slowly the conversation grew into being that what it is today but it began with friendship and mutual admiration for each other so there's been a lot of inspiring conversation that's quite cool isn't it they were friends they were at home chilling you know wrecking up some lines together eating some fucking salad maybe doing some push-ups together some burpees and they decided hey you know what why don't I invest in your brand? I've got more money than God. Why don't I get involved? I love this. What learnings and ideas have you got, have you gained um, to bring in to Alex from Givenchy? I assume the experience was informative. He says, yeah, I mean, <laughs> he doesn't talk that well about Givenchy, does he? I've got a feeling it didn't end well. He doesn't really talk that glowingly about his time at Givenchy. I don't think it ended well at all. That's the feeling that I get. I don't think it ended well at all. I mean, yeah, it's been a massive experience for managing teams at that scale, working with traditional marketing, outdoor advertising, campaigns for magazines, and especially retail. That was just something I'd never worked in prior to Vigivancy. And so all of that experience has been huge. I mean, the level of accessories that I was making there, the control with women's wear, the shoes, the jewelry, all of that, and the skill set was so ramped up. The ability to create with the engine for so many years, I learned so much. Okay, cool. Again, not a lot spoken about, you know, the great people there, but the learnings were there. Cool. So let's see if that elevates fucking Alex. It continues here. One thing I've been thinking about a lot, it's not super directly related to the transition, although it kind of is, is Bin Trill. You, Virgil, Heron Preston, really defined an era of American fashion on a global stage. In your mind, how did the experience of being in Bin Trill shape what you do and how you got to this moment? You know what, right? I'm, I hate they answered it that way, but you have to give a lot of respect to that Bin Chill era because those guys were able to achieve way more than what Bin Chill kind of looked like, you know, at the time that it came out. Like, I don't think anybody, maybe even themselves, could have ever envisioned that they would get to the the pinnacle the top of the top of the fashion pyramid when they were doing this sort of shit right when they had this bin trill this drippy you know comic sans type of font on shit when they had the hashtags when they had the fucking hats and uh you know the 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 chief keith merch the travis scott shit like some of the dj activations i don't think any of these guys could have really seen a future where the bin trill thing would have taken them to you know becoming the force of nature they were whereas Virgil you know obviously RIP to him becoming the flipping career director at Louis Vuitton and obviously building from fucking Off-White Justin Saunders um turning fucking Jound into one of the biggest brands out there and one of the coolest kind of you know collaborator incubators that exist from fucking Matthew Williams doing his thing with Alix and then going to Givenchy Heron Preston who I've never really thought of as a fashion guy getting into fashion for the first time then building up his brand to 
be really popular and then now recently i think he got the what well, he got appointed as i think the head of some h&m project or something right and then before that he was doing the gap thing so everybody here really did amazingly well for themselves off of the back of a really kind of basic um kind of um i wouldn't say ugly but a really a really a brand that didn't really age well you know it was really kind of a, for the moment it was kind of more of a cool cachet cultural thing none of the stuff they did was really kind of pushing the envelope of design really for the most part maybe some of the graphics were cool some of the activations they did i remember they did the activation actually inside some like store like a kind of like a in-shop store thing in, in new york somewhere that was kind of cool but again nothing was kind of you know nothing was crazy amazing in terms of the design they did but the the uh, success they were able to achieve off the back of that really doesn't get spoken about enough and i hope somebody does make a documentary about like how much these guys were able to achieve off of the back of you know starting from this sort of platform it really is a an example as to you know the only limits to your you know ability to succeed are really within your imagination really is like you, if you can you know taking what they did here like look at this bin show diamonds shirt like you know this is awful like been trill the hashtag on the diamond the diamond like this is disgusting right <laughs> but somehow this shirt was one of the launching pads that took them to where going to where they're going so big up been trill but obviously for some reason i don't know what it is about these designers but they always do this whenever they ask them these type of questions it's as, all, it's as if they're always as if they're as, as, uh, ashamed of their origins Whenever they ask one of these streetwear guys, oh, when they finally get into fashion, oh, how did the streetwear journey help you to get this fashion job? Like, not really. I don't make streetwear. It's like the same with this. Like, now, how did Bintrill help you? How, you know, the transition, da, 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 how did it inform you? I don't really see it as part of my stepping stone in my fashion career. Like, come on, Matthew Williams. Come on, Matthew M. Williams. Let's be for real. Would anybody have known who you were without Bintrill? Bintrill then led to Alix. Alix then leads to fucking Givenchy. Come on, brother. Let's be real obviously the lady gaga costume design era was obviously really important too but let's be true like let's be true actually right it started from bin trill then it went from alix then it went from don't, don't say it's a bad thing but maybe he's just ashamed of that era because the design was so shit i don't know but his answer is i don't really see it as part of my stepping stone in my fashion career it's really something fun i was doing in my friends and it was about music and having people of similar interests come together in a shared space in a shared environment i wasn't about it wasn't about DJing for money or even social media or whatever it was. It was just, um, we just wanted to hear music that we wanted to hear when we were going out. It was very pure. And that's what I really loved about it. I went to Berghain a few weeks ago. Oh, wow. Hello. Matthew Williams in Berghain. Yeah, nice. And it was so nice to be there with nobody having their phone out. Everyone dancing. It's so rare to find a space um, where people are actually all dancing and present together these days. Everyone is so on their phone. And so, and, and so if anything, I think that was so great about being Trill was it was really it was a party that everyone was welcome to i was playing it was playing music that was really just living on the internet for the most part and playing in the physical world it was really it was uh, it was really using bintro as a platform to do collaborations with the brands and people that we love um from a fashion perspective doesn't this sound like a fashion stepping stone none of us really designed anything but it was something that was wasn't so precious it was really free all ideas were welcome he starts off this answer by saying that it wasn't a stepping stone but then he explains why it was a stepping stone. <laughs> it's like, come on, Matthew Williams, man. It was. It was a vibe. But I do agree with him, obviously, about the point about Berghain. That's obviously one of the main reasons why people like myself are obsessed with that club because there aren't really a lot of spaces that you can go to where people aren't just obsessively having their phone out especially when it comes to like a entertainment -y type arena it's just really difficult to go to places where people are just really kind of present and in the moment so that's part of the reason why that club is so amazing obviously the design of it the architecture the sound system the djs all that flipping add to it but for sure the element of just taking away your phone and again they don't take this is the thing that's funny about it they don't take your phone all they do is cover your phone lens camera and they say to you, if you take that shit out and try and take a picture, you're getting chucked out and you might get permanently blacklisted. So that is obviously a fear. And because it's so hard to get in, why would you then get yourself chucked out because you want to take a selfie? It doesn't make any sense. But they don't even take your phone. They just cover the lens of it. But because they cover the lens of your phone, it almost makes it 
you know, it almost makes it redundant, <laughs> you know? It doesn't exist as a smartphone um, because it doesn't have a camera anymore. Now the, ca the camera doesn't work. The camera is covered by a sticker. Now it doesn't really count. So you just, you know, you don't bother using it. That's obviously the funny bit about that. Um, but I do love um, that he mentioned the stuff about hearing music out in the clubs that you would never hear. And I think that's a one odd thing that I don't really understand about club culture in general. And maybe that has to, maybe that's more to say about the music that's been produced. But I always found it interesting that, especially in London even, there's not a lot of nightclubs you can go to where you can hear somebody playing music that you hear on the internet. Like there's not a lot of clubs I can think of, even club nights, that if I want to hear Playboy Carti, if I want to hear Destroy Lonely, if I want to hear, I don't know, whatever, you know, um, ye, all these type of artists, there's not really places I can go to where I can hear it. You kind of have to do it yourself. You kind of have to just figure out, okay, cool. I can't have this. I can't hear this stuff out. I'm just going to create my own club night. But it doesn't really exist a place to hear it. And I don't know if that's more of a reflection on the music itself, not really kind of, you know, not really maybe working in clubs so people don't play it or maybe just the demand isn't there. I don't really know, but I always found that very interesting. Like you can't really find spaces where you can hear that stuff played on a lot. If anything, a lot of the clubs, especially in London that play hip hop, they mainly play a lot of old shit. Like when I say old shit, I mean like stuff up until like 2015, 2018. They don't really play a lot of like the current stuff now. Like if a new album drops, you know, and it's got a banger tune that everybody's fucking, you know, salivating over on social media, you'll rarely hear it the following week, you know, in a club. You don't really hear it a lot. It's not really a thing, which is really bizarre. And I wish that would be different, but it's not. It kind of is what it is. Um, but let's continue. Did that party at Bergheim remind you of bintral parties? <laughs> Come on, bro. That's how you know you're talking to an American journalist. A bintral party is not like a, a, a fucking Bergheim party at all. A bintral party is like any other influencer activation, you know, store launch party that exists, right? Where people have their phones out and they're fucking taking pictures and they're all fucking, you know, in the moment trying to, you know, get, you know, try to make a moment at the moment. Like it's, it's all about them all that sort of nonsense. That's what it is. It, and it's all about being seen as well. Whereas, you know, Bergheim Raves or Raves of that ilk are mostly about the music. They're mostly about surrendering yourself to the, you know, to the environment, being quite present and just fucking dancing your face off and not really giving a fuck. That's what mostly about, mo that's what most those parties are actually about. So they're kind of different, you know. And of course, Bintral parties are like kind of commerce as well. It's a different sort of vibe, right? It's mostly like a commerce type of thing. It continues here. No, it didn't. But I had most fun I've had in many years at Berghain, and that was because everyone was present dancing. They were there for the music. It was pure. It was super special. Um, it was something super rare. I don't know where else in the world you could do that, um, where you could go and do that anymore. And again, that's a sad thing about it. That's why as much as it's great to go places at Berghain, I sometimes don't like going there too often because it can be, make it really hard to party in places that aren't Berlin especially in London, because it's the complete opposite of that place. Um, it can be make really, really hard. It kind of sets your expectations really high. It kind of makes you feel as if like all places should be like that. But really and truly, they can't, right? Um, for much as I love Berlin, you can't really copy that lifestyle in London. It, you know, people here would die if they were able to party from Friday to Tuesday. They would honestly die, myself included. They would actually RIP. It wouldn't work. So I think the fact that that place exists and it's there and it's in a bit of a bubble is great because if you want to pop in and visit there, you can. But for the most part, I don't think the rest of the world could handle that level of debauchery, that level of, um, you know, that level of just nightlife that level of party that level of drugs that level of drinking that level of music um anywhere else i don't think it works but i think it works there because it just works there are you going to do an after uh, are you doing an alix show in january what's the immediate plan no i don't know when our next show is going to be why is that there's just a natural period when we're doing business transactions um transitions like this and moving things to another country so it just makes sense for us to do it another day cool i like that but going forward you'll be showing in paris is yeah what do you next couple of weeks have in store for you how are you finishing up the year i'm going to hong kong on sunday to do a pop-up for the nike air force one collaboration at k11 and spend time with adrian and then from there we're going to go to bhutan what's up in bhutan i'm going to find out i'll let you know Okay, cool. He doesn't seem like the most chatty person in the world, but still, drop some good knowledge. Yeah, yo, big up Rodeo Brito. Big up, big up my guy Rodeo. Um, but yeah, oh yeah, big, <laughs> big up Harvey Long. 
<laughs> ah, big up Bobby Long, what's good? But yeah, um, Matthew Williams sounds a funny guy, interesting dude. Um, again, I think the Alix sale has been explained here. Um, basically, he wanted to grow the brand. He wants to open retail stores. He wants to expand into accessories and other product categories that he probably couldn't do himself because it just requires way too much investment and capital to put into it. Um, and obviously, now that he's experienced the Givenchy side of things, the cap fashion with a capital F, I think he's realized the grass isn't actually green on the other side. I think a lot of these guys, I think they do sometimes, you know, put fashion world on a pedestal. I think they kind of take their brands for granted. They don't look at their brand as the equivalent of a Givenchy. They just see it as like a, a mediocre, you know, a mediocre kind of copy of those type of things when really and truly you're making your own history you're creating your own legacy um you're setting your own standards um you're writing your own story with your own brand uh, and you can kind of do it any way you want to do it so actually you know putting those brands on the pedestal is actually not a good thing because you know you're basically an employee if they want to get rid of you whenever they want to get rid of you they can you don't really have full creative license really um the parameters and the kind of you know the things that you have to kind of hit to kind of keep your job necessarily don't really align to creativity and full expression they're mostly business things there's obviously the element of working for a company and having to be a good employee and get along with people all these type of things that kind of you know aren't necessarily based on just the work that you do that can hamper or affect your ability to succeed so really focusing on your own brand probably is a way to go because you know you've got more room to kind of live there you're a bit of wingers dingus 35 wingers mcdingus this youtube content is truly <laughs> commendable and i must applaud them for the fantastic work i was introduced to this content this week and i genuinely appreciate and derive great satisfaction <laughs> this meme is so funny man this meme is never gonna end <laughs> this meme is so good <laughs> this youtube content got me it's so it's never gonna die i hope it never dies i hope that meme never fucking dies 35 this youtube content <laughs> but big up wingus mcdingus appreciate you bro appreciate you um but yeah one thing last thing i want to mention about this this is another example as to why i think you have to give supreme a lot of props supreme started off they did a little bit of wholesale, a tiny bit of wholesale when they started. I think, if I'm not mistaken, they were kind of sold in the original kind of union store um, and a few other stores around the world as well, right? But for the most part, they've always only sold it within their own retail stores, their own brick and mortar stores, right? They started a very small one store in New York and then, of course, slowly but surely grew and expanded. And I think, apart from Supreme being the premier streetwear brand and obviously in a league of its own, I think part of the reason why Supreme has been able to last this long at the top and maintain this level of appeal has been because they were able to create their world create their ecosystem um, create their environment from minute one they already had a store they already was able to create an aesthetic a vibe about the brand based on the people that worked there based on the music that was played the interior design where the stores were located the pictures all this sort of shit revolved around being able to craft and kind of build your own world that people had to then visit you didn't you couldn't get the supreme experience in like a retail mall you couldn't get it in like a random store somewhere you had to get it by going to their retail stores and that kind of pilgrimage because like myself you know before supreme was listed on you know the europe side of things because you, you know the u.s store has been open for a while but the europe the europe's thing wasn't really a, a wasn't always there you had to kind of travel to the supreme stores if you want to buy stuff or get stuff delivered to you via proxy but when i first kind of made the quote-unquote pilgrimage to the new york store it really was something it really kind of gave you a, a a tingly kind of feeling to be able to finally go to the store that you only saw in magazines and magazine scans and youtube videos and whatever it may be to find able to step into that store and hear the fucking music blasting from the speakers see all the skaters that you see in lookbooks and kind of campaigns that you'd see modeling some of the things in there see all the other characters involved the supreme and the team behind them and stuff in the cultural scene and stuff in the art world design world, all that stuff being around there and stuff all that stuff kind of added to the actual brand so i think a lot of these brands nowadays are realizing that as much as it's great to start your brand off 
you know, being sold in all these big department stores and retail chains and shopping malls around the world and shit and having it ha be on the same rack as, a, you know, as Balenciaga and all this sort of nonsense. I think actually having your own retail store where you can actually tell your own story is actually far more important than having your brand stocked in a million different stores around the world that don't exactly, um, you know, kind of uh, align with your vision and aren't exactly um, focused on trying to um bring you know highlight your brand in the best possible way because you know no matter how big your brand is if it's if it's in a retail store somewhere it's just going to be on a rack right it's not going to be displayed the right way it's not going to be merchandised the right way um it's just going to be another t-shirt on a rack so if you actually do want to tell a better story if you actually do want to display it in a far better light you just need to have your own retail store where you can actually tell that story but obviously the risk is retail stores are really hard to get right they're really hard to make work um the investment is crazy and um there's no guarantee that even if you do tell the story right that people are going to give a shit so that's obviously the risk but i think brands are now seeing that risk is probably worth to take in the long term because that retail store thing really does um separate you from everybody else out there because you're able to kind of like i said create your own little world that people have to come and visit have to kind of immerse themselves in and you could obviously tell you could obviously have other things you know attached to it like you know store launches magazines that you sell in there books coffee whatever the fuck you're doing the djs that play there in the corner artwork on the walls all these things can kind of inform the brand and kind of allow people to see the clothes that you have available on a rack in a different light because maybe there is a lot of work that goes into the hardware design of alix stuff maybe there's a there's a lot of like you know brainstorming um, and ideation that goes into some of their graphics that goes into some of the fucking the buttons they choose on their jackets the zips the finishes you know what i mean um whatever it may be but you don't see it because the jacket just listed on the store somewhere or it's just on a rack somewhere but maybe with the actual own retail store you can actually tell those more interesting stories and give people an insight into what kind of goes into making some of your pieces so they have a different appreciation for it and then they have a different sense of loyalty to the brand and it can be one of those brands that they can kind of you know grow old with over time that could be a thing that could be a thing but big up matthew williams really really cool interview there with jq gq jq